Greetings, everyone. Uh, today we are extremely excited and feel so blessed to have Tanajan Suchat Abhijato joining us. Tanajan, thank you so much for, for joining us. Happy to, to be with you today. Um, so I'll just read a quick biography of Tanajan. Uh, so Tanajan Suchat Abhijato was born in Thailand, in Bangkok, in 1947 and received a Bachelor's of Science degree in civil engineering from California State University before returning to Thailand to manage a small business in Pattaya. Receiving a copy of a Dharma book, the wheel publication on Anicca, from a tourist, he realized the importance of meditation and wrote to the Buddhist Publication Society to receive more. He received from them a copy of the Satipatthana Sutta, which he then chanted and practiced diligently. Leaving his job in 1974 to meditate full time, he was ordained at Wat Bawan um, by Somdet Nyan himself in 1975, thanks to the help of Bhikkhu Kantipalo before traveling to Wat Ba Bantad, where he would train under Longta Mahabua for the next nine years. For his 10th range retreat, Tanajan Suchat came back to Pattaya, where he has remained ever since. You can find more of his teachings on prasuchat.com. So, Tanajan, we thought this morning uh, to just keep most of our questions around the theme of the body, the first Satipatthana. Um, so to that end, would you be able to contextualize, to just give people uh, who might not be familiar with meditation on the body, what role does contemplating the body serve in Buddhist meditation, Buddhist practice? Well, the first role that it plays is the development of mindfulness, or sati. We use the body as the object of focus to prevent our mind from drifting into various thoughts. If we have something to anchor the mind with, like the body, the body say, the Buddha say in the Satipatthana Sutta that we should be mindful of the four postures of the body, whether standing, sitting, walking, or lying down. And also we should be mindful with every activity the body is doing, whether eating, washing or do whatever. Just keep watch, concentrate on the work that the body is doing in order to prevent the mind from thinking about other things. So this is the first purpose of using the body to develop mindfulness. Because without mindfulness, we will not be able to succeed in meditation. We want the mind to get into jhana, into the fourth jhana. So we have to have strong mindfulness to be able to focus only on one object, such as the breath when we sit down and meditate. So this works together. When you're not meditating, you're developing mindfulness. From the time you get up, as soon as you get up, watch your body. Where is your body now? In what position your body is in? And keep following every movement of the body. It's getting up, it's walking, it's going to the toilet, uh, doing whatever it's doing. Just stay with the body at all times. This only works for monks who have nothing else to do. You know? But for lay people, they have hardly have to worry about what to, what is today, what am I going to do today. So all, all kinds of thoughts will come in right away. But for us monks, we don't have to worry about these things. So we just focus on the body. Thank you, Tanajan. Um, on that note, the instruction to maintain uh, uninterrupted mindfulness with, with the body uh, is one I've, and many monks I know have tried to institute before. And I know for myself and some other monks, um, when we've really tried to force our minds to remain constantly without break in that satipatthana, um, things have gotten quite uh, tight and stressed and create um, in the Thai uh, so how would you, what would you, what advice would you give to a practitioner who wants to follow that advice, but finds it almost too constricting or that they're just not able to remain with the body, a hundred percent of the time? Well, when you first started, you will not be able to do it that all the time. You probably do it for a few min minutes or seconds and then your mind already go and thinking about the past or the future. But the, the goal is to try to stay with the body as much as possible. 
if you find it stressful sometimes, maybe you can use the mantra if you like, beside Bhutto, 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 as you do whatever you're supposed to be doing, sweeping, cleaning, going on Bintabad, just beside Bhutto, Bhutto, mantra. But you can also use other types of mantra or recitation, like you can use the 32, 32 parts of the body if you like, hair of the head, hair of the body, so forth. It's just to keep the mind busy. Mm -hmm. So it won't be able to go think about other things. And these are the thought that is useful to the mind. You learn about the 32 parts of the body. And you're getting wisdom at the same time, as well as getting mindfulness. If you use the, the body, the, the 32 parts of the body as your, your mantra. Your, your, Hmm. So okay. this is something you, you can alternate. Sometimes my li some Thai people might like to use chanting itipiso pakawa arahang sama sambuto. You can do this also hmm. to maybe to 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 ease the boredom that you have to fix your attention at the body only. Hmm. I don't know. This is something you have to improvise. But the goal is to not let your mind drift into aimless thoughts daydreaming and thinking about usually samsara, things in samsara, like the four, the four worldly dhamma, wealth, uh, wealth status, praises, and the sensual objects. This is what the mind likes to go think about. Well, how, how should I get more money? How should I become bigger, better in my position and so forth? We want to stop this, the mind from thinking about this thing. Because if you think about this thing, you'll, then what will follow will be your defilements, and your, your greed, your cravings will come. And then this will create more stress for the mind. Tanajan, could, could you say more about meditation on the postures? You mentioned uh, when one's going about or sitting or lying down, just to only do that. And the instructions in the Satipatthana Sutta are very basic, and um, yeah, there's not much elaboration there. How does one do that? Oh, it's just—it's not meditation. It's just to know know your body, watch your body. Just know that your body is standing, sitting, or walking, or lying down. And if it's doing something also, then you have to know that also. Like if, you, if the body—if you turn your head to the left, turn your head to the right—you have to be aware of these things that's going on with the body. Mindfulness, this is the, it's not meditation yet, this is mindfulness. Mm. To keep the mind busy watching the body, so it won't have the time to go think about other things. And in that, that sutta, it kind of breaks up, you have the section on postures, and then you've got the section on activities, and then you've got the section on 32 parts. Is it important, or does one need to have distinct ideas about when one is practicing one of those, or does it just yes, flow into yes. one another? No? There, okay. are, there are three different stages of practice. First, like I said, you want to develop mindfulness first. So if you have continuous mindfulness, then you will be able to sit and meditate and watch your breath. And then you will be able to enter into jhana. Once you have jhana, you have samadhi, you have equanimity. After you come out of jhana, then you can develop wisdom by studying the nature of the body. Then, Tanajan, oh, go ahead. Just to take that um, side or that tangent um, or clarify the goal a bit more, why is jhana essential here? And what guidance would you give to, I know many modern uh, Western practitioners conditioned by a culture which has them thinking a lot find it very difficult to access jhana. So how do you guide your um, Western or modern disciples towards, towards the jhanas? Well, the jhana is very important because it, once you reach the fourth jhana, you have contentment and you have happiness, the kind of happiness that excel all other kinds of happiness. The happiness that you get from sensual pleasures will, will be not as good as the, the pleasure you get from meditation. So once you have this, then you, you can switch your, your, 
the, the way you go after pleasure instead of going after the essential pleasure. Now you can go and meditate and have peace of mind as, as the pleasure. And with this mind that has been calm and contented, it will be it will have the strength to resist the, the cravings. Once you come out, when you come out of meditation, when you start to be in contact with sensual objects, the craving will start. Then you can use wisdom to teach the mind that craving for this thing will end up in dukkha, in suffering. Mm. Because these sensual objects are, are impermanent. They are temporarily, they can give you a temporary pleasure. But once they're gone, it'll leave you empty, sad, and sad. So this is wisdom teaching the mind not to go after sensual pleasure. And if the mind has equanimity, have contentment from smart, from samadhi, from jhana, then the mind can stop the craving. But if you don't have contentment from jhana, you will not be able to stop the cravings. Because you have nothing, you still you, you you are empty. Your mind is empty, and you need something to keep it happy. But once you have jhana, you have something to keep it happy. So it doesn't need to go after the sensual objects anymore. Tanshan, how do you encourage people who find jhana difficult, who start off and they're getting all their pleasure from things of the world, sensual pleasures, and then they come to Buddhism and they renounce and they give up all the start keeping the five precepts, eight precepts, and it seems like their happiness is getting lower and lower, but they haven't yet gotten the jhanas to have this extreme great happiness. How do you encourage people when they, it seems like they're giving up but not getting much happiness back? Well, this is something that they have to convince themselves that the jhana is the best thing for them, and they have to put in the effort to develop mindfulness. So they have to go into a retreat in order to be able to, to to meditate and get into jhana. If they just want to do it just a half an hour a day, then that's, that's not, there's no way of, of, of getting the jhana. You have to be in a retreat. You know, even for monks who have been, been ordained for many years, forest monks even, they even find hard for them to, to enter into jhana. There's no, a great it's, it's not easy, but it's not impossible. There's a lot of debate in the West around what jhana entails, and you know, some teachers define it in different ways. How does one know if they've encountered jhana, um, and maybe in particular the fourth jhana, rather than just a state of bright concentration? Well, you feel a sense of release. The pressure in the mind completely disappears. To the stress, anxiety, worries, and everything just gone, and all you have left is just like emptiness, right? Yeah. But emptiness with peace and have with contentment. So this is something that it, you you flip the mind from 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 dukkha side to niroda side. That's what happens in in jhana. How is this distinct from awakening or the awakened mind, which also is empty and bright? It is not yet awakening because it's, it's being developed by mindfulness, not wisdom. See, awakening means to see the Four Noble Truths, to see that the, the, the dukkha or the stress are created by the defilements of the cravings and be able to somehow get rid of the craving by seeing that whatever the, the object of cravings, they are not satisfactory. They're not, they're temporarily happiness. They're not permanent happiness. And they have to come to an end one day, sooner or later. And when that happens, one will feel sad and, and, and lonely. And so one has to see this with wisdom, see, to see the impermanent nature of things that the cravings go after. So once you see that you're going after dukkha, not going, you're not going after happiness. You're going after sadness, because that's what's going to happen in the end. Then you can stop your cravings. This is awakening. This is enlightenment. And when you can stop your craving, the mind will become peaceful and still like as if you enter into jhana, without having to enter into jhana. That's the difference. 
Tanajan, could you talk more about going from the side of dukkha to the side of niroda? Is that only, does one only start going into the niroda side of things in jhana or in stream entry? Or are there, is there an aspect of that even once one is just giving things up and maybe even just being more generous and keeping precepts, does that go into the side of niroda as you were talking about or cessation? You have to have dukkha first. Okay. <laughs> you have to have suffering first. Like for instance, if you're, let's, let's put it in the worldly terms so people can understand. If you lose your job, for instance, how, how would you feel? You feel bad, right? You're not you're gonna have, you have no income. What's, what you're gonna do, you know? And you feel stressful. So if you use the four noble truth, then you say your stress is caused by your craving. Craving for what? Craving for job. You lose your job. Now you want you want to have your job, but you cannot have it. So if you use wisdom to investigate the nature of the job, then you see that it's impermanent, right? You sometimes have your job and sometimes you lose your job. So if you don't want to have any dukkha from from the from from getting a job, then don't work you know, and become a monk instead. And give up working, then you won't have any stress regarding the the work, the job that you're doing, because you don't know when you will be laid off or not. So you have to look at the nature of the the work, the job that you do. That is is impermanent, and it's anatta, meaning you cannot control it. You cannot keep it all the time. It can it can disappear any time, any any day. So if you don't want to have any dukkha, then just give up your attachment to working, to job. Then you can enroll that when you start your craving. Tanajan, you have people come to you for questions and answers, for advice, for training um, all the time. You have monks coming to you for interviews. Um, and what do you feel when you look out at the world of um, all these people chasing after, as you put it, dukkha? Um, at a kind of a world overcome with delusion, what what do you feel, um, or or how do you, yeah, how do you exist in relation to that? They they don't see the impermanent nature of things in this world. Everything is impermanent. I was lucky to get the book. The first book I got was on impermanent, and this is something that has always been on my mind long before I read this book. I saw the impermanent of the body when a, a schoolmate died from drowning and I have to attend the funeral and see his body in the casket. When I saw the body, I just contemplate that my body will also be like his body. One day I'm going to be in that casket also. And not just my body, everybody's body that I, that I love will enter the casket one day. So this keep keep me. It's always stay in the back of my mind. Whenever I see things, I know everything here in this world is just temporary. And if you become attached to it, or crave for it, when you lose it, you will, you will have dukkha. You have suffering. So this is what people need to see, that everything in this world is impermanent, anicca, and they are anatta because you cannot control them. You cannot keep them for as long as you like. Yeah. Tanjan, you, you talk about the value of going into retreat and specifically doing a lot of meditation and jhana practice. There are these, a certain number of suttas which talk about a path of generating faith or keeping precepts or uh, being generous or even study and that leading to pamoja or well-being, which then leads to piti or joy which then leads to tranquility, pasadi, which then leads to sukha, and from sukha to samadhi. Um, what do you think about that path, which seems a little bit different from like the very intense uh, jhana retreat practice? It's the same path, but on a different level, that's all. We're talking on the, the highest level, yeah. the, the, the professional level. <laughs> why why the, the, the level you were talking about well, for more amateur, for, for people who can only practice partially. Mm. So if they cannot practice this, then they should develop 
Dana first, de develop Sela first, to at least to prepare the mind to be more accept accepting of the spiritual way of life. Yeah. Tanajan, speaking about the two levels of practice, um, or these kind of different uh, grades of practice, I heard a Dhamma talk, and returning to the theme of the body here, with Longpur Pliyan once, where he was asked about contemplating the repulsiveness of food. And he said, that's kindergarten. Uh, contemplation of the elements is high Dhamma. And I know I've visited um, some renowned teachers who all they talk about is the four elements, just dividing up experience into four elements. And there does seem to be something very particularly powerful about that way of looking at the world and, and the self or the, the body. What's the, how would you place contemplation of the elements in relation to the other ways of contemplating the body, like the 32 parts or the charnel ground? Is the elements a higher or more demanding contemplation or more insightful at all? It depends what the result you want from this contemplation. See. The reason why you have contemplate on a supa, on the repulsiveness of the body, you want to dispel or get rid of the of the attractive parts of the body, attractive side of the body. See when you see the body outside with with the makeups and all the head do's and clothing, it looks like a beautiful body. And you can get sensual or sexual desire from, from looking at this type of body. So you want to get rid of the sexual desire, then you have to look at the other type of the body. Look at the super side of the body. Look inside, under the skin. Like the saying goes, beauty is skin deep. Right? Once you go under the skin, there's nothing beautiful about the, this body. When you start to see the skeleton and all the internal organs, like the heart, lungs, liver, intestine, and so forth. You have to look at this other side of the body. See? Then you can stop your sexual desire. Why do you want to stop your sexual desire? Because you're, you're, you're keeping the precept. You're a monk, for instance. You, and you also, you don't want to get, uh, get what you call luck, luck, in, luck with this sex, sexual desire because it can be quite tormenting. When you have when you have this desire and you cannot have what you want, so you want to stop this sexual desire so you can be free, and you, then you can then you can enjoy your meditative life. So this is the purpose of asupa. But as far as the four elements are concerned, this is usually for the purpose of seeing anatta, no self. Mm. Look at the body like elements, like chemical. Our body uh, um, contains all the, the chemo chemical elements, oxygen, hydrogen. But in ancient times, they, they divided the element into to four, these four types. The earth element, which means the solid part. The water part, the, the water element means the, the, the liquid part. Yeah. And the air element, or the wind element, refers to the gas, the thing that we inhale like oxygen and so forth. And the last one, the fire element, it ref refers to the heat, to the temperature in the body, which we get from the sun and also from the, the interaction of the, uh, the other three elements when they go into the body. The food that you eat and the water that you drink, once they go into the body, they have chemical reaction. And one of, one of the results is that you get heat from this chemical reaction. If you study chemistry, you, you, will, you know that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the four elements. No, no self in this body, it's just, just element, nitrogen, oxygen, and so forth. They come in and then, then they, they, they combine and then they, they build the 32 parts. The 32 parts from, come from these four elements. And then one day when this body stops breathing, then the four elements will start to separate. First go the, the wind element, when you no longer breathe. Then whatever wind element you have left in your body will evaporate. Then followed by the fire element, which is the heat. The body becomes cold. 
and after that the fluid in the body will, will come relieve the, the body and later on you have all you have them are just the 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 earth element the solid parts of the body which become uh, what you call become it turn into dust or, or earth eventually so this is the four elements you want to look at the body just being an element so that you can dispel the notion that there's a self there's you in this body mm. there's no you you just come from the mind which is another type of element called the knowing mm. element which happens to possess this body and take control of this body and use it as a an instrument to access the the sensual objects because the knowing element have this craving for sensual pleasure so in these sensual objects and in this the body to do this for for it Tanajam, whether it's the 32 parts that list from the the suttas or the four elements or reflecting on the modern periodic table how does a practitioner who really is trying to devote themselves to this practice balance like the creativity which gives rise to interest like thinking as you were saying like when the body decays it you know the these different elements decrease versus the simplicity of just saying you know hair of the head hair of the head hair of the head repeating one of the 32 parts or just earth 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 so balancing how does one balance creativity and simplicity oh, that that when you re- recite a part of the body this is just a mantra you use to 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 calm your mind when you meditate Sometimes people like to use the parts of the body as the object of meditation. Like sometimes people recite skeleton, skeleton, or ati, or bone. You know? mm-hmm. Or sometimes they even uh, imagine the, the, the picture of the bone of the skeleton in the mind and use that as an object of meditation. And, and that's okay to be creative in whether visualizing or just saying it or thinking about it. First, you have to know the purpose of doing it. See, there are many different purposes using the body. If you want to use mindfulness, then you just focus on just one object. Or, or you can use several objects. But when you when you develop mindfulness, you can use several objects. But when you want to meditate, you have to use one object. Because the mind, in order for it to become still, it has to be focused only on one object. If it still runs around with several objects, it will not be able to become fully calm or still. Tananjan, sometimes the Buddha gives a list of four elements, and sometimes he gives a list of six, including consciousness and space. So you referenced just earlier the knowing element, which wants to possess the body and experience sensual experiences. Um, how, how does... That sounds a lot like... Uh, uh, a, a version of Atman almost. How does one encounter the knowing element and not take it as a self? And and what's left when you let go of the knowing element? I mean, it seems like it might be one and the same with the chitta. Um, how is that not a self? Well, you experience this when you enter to jhana. When you enter the, the fourth jhana, <clears throat> the thoughts of a self disappear. All that is level, just knowing. See. So you know, oh, the mind, this is the nature of the mind, just the knowing. <clears throat> and the, the thinking is the one that creates the concept of a self. Hmm. See, when you think you are, therefore you are, right? When you stop thinking, then you disappear with your, with your thinking. That's why you want to enter the fourth jhana, to see that the real nature of the knowing element which is knowing. <clears throat> then after you come out of meditation, then you use that experience to remind yourself that the mind is just a knowing element, a knower, not a, not, not a person, not, not a self, hmm. and try to act as a knowing element, just to act just knowing. When you see something, the Buddha says, just merely know. When you see something, just merely know what you see, what you hear. Don't react. When you act, when you start to react, you're using the self to react. Tanjan, um, what what 
how would you advise someone who we're mostly talking about the body here, the first foundation of mindfulness, but it seems there are people maybe who had just have more affinity to actually practice that third foundation of mindfulness, but that is mind knowing mind before actually getting to the third jhana and maybe even taking that knowing element as the object of meditation, perhaps to get to jhana. How would you advise a person like that? And they're not self deluded. It really is being with that knowing element. Um, is that a path to get to jhana is taking the knowing element, the Buddha, the one who knows as the object? I don't know. I haven't tried. <laughs> I, cannot, I just follow the, the, the body as the object of concentration, object of meditation, object of mindfulness. Mm -hmm. See, when you talk about the, the, the feelings and the mental state, we're, we're talking about vipassana more, not mm -hmm. on developing jhana. See, we have to understand these three things which we are involved with, the body, the feelings, and the mental states. Then we have to see them as anijang dukkha monata. That's a, you cannot control them. You cannot control your feeling. Only make to have good feelings all the time. You cannot do that. You cannot have the mental state to be peaceful and calm only. Sometimes you have stress. Sometimes you have agitation. You have restlessness. These are due to conditions that the mind been exposed to. See, and sometimes you cannot do anything about it. So you. The way to deal with it is just to leave it alone. Don't try to manage or try to control it because when you try it and you don't, don't succeed, you're creating more craving. You're creating more stress for the mind. So Tanajan, in terms of letting go of stress completely, um, this practice of body contemplation isn't taught often in the West. And yet when you read the suttas or read uh, the tales and teachings of the forest masters, often breaking through uh, the khanda of the body and having insight into it seems to be powerful enough that it actually ushers someone into stream entry, the first vision of enlightenment. Is that often an associated breakthrough? And if so, how would one know that one had genuinely experienced stream entry as opposed to just a moment of, of sort of more mundane insight? Well, you have to have dukkha with the body first, like when you're diagnosed that you have cancer, for instance, terminal cancer, how would you, normally how would your, your mind react? Stressful, right? Okay. So if you want to become a sotapanna, you have to get rid of the stress. <laughs> not, 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 not fixing the, the cancer because the, the, the illness is not something you can, you can do, you can control. The body is subjected to sickness. So you have to see that the body is impermanent and then accept this truth that it's impermanent, it's going to get sick, it's going gonna, it's gonna to die. If you can accept this truth, then you, the stress will disappear from your mind. Then you can become a sotapanna. You're not afraid of death, you're not afraid of sickness, you're not afraid of aging. So you have to understand the nature of the body and accept it. Yeah. It's impermanent. Anicca is anatta. It's not you. You're not the body. You're the mind. But your delusion keeps telling you you're the body. So when I, whenever things happen to your body, the mind starts to become stressful. And the mind itself isn't affected by the body at all, by the sickness of the body at all. Tanajan, um, Ajahn Jeff, translates the Satipatthana as frames of reference. And so for the most part today, we've been talking about the body as the frame of reference and just taking that all the way to jhana and then to stream entry and further. Uh, is there, how necessary is it to always, if we've decided on this frame, to always stay in there? Or are there times or parts of one's practice where say one feels like the body contemplation of the body, looking at the body, even yeah, practicing meditation is just, it's not interesting, or it seems like it's at a dead end. Is there a place to shift to a different frame of reference to just shift into this just knowing 
or to shift into just watching feelings instead? And how does one do that, if that's okay? I think the problem with, with modern people is we, we know too much. <laughs> and and this, this, this knowledge keeps making us all, all confused. You know? So it's better to be uh, illiterate, uh, hill tribe people, and just follow the teaching of the teacher. Like Ajahn Man said, just recite Bhutto. All you have to know is how to recite Bhutto. <laughs> and don't worry about the rest. Get get the the mindfulness first. Get into the jhana first. Then he'll teach you how to deal with the body as the next as the next step. Yeah. Now we we're getting everything of the whole course, but we we cannot digest them. We don't have the ability to digest them. So mm-hmm. it's all become so confusing for us. Yeah. So in, in in actual learning, if you go practice in the forest tradition, you usually start first to develop mindfulness and not worry about anything else. Just stay mindful. And the teacher will constantly yell at you when you're not mindful. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, Tanajan, when you uh, you lived with Long Tam Mahabua, one of the most renowned teachers in Thailand for years, um, do you have any stories of him guiding you or another monk um, that are particularly kind of notable in terms of either being fierce or compassionate? Well, he teaches by example how, how he lived, how he, how he practiced, and he teaches also by, by giving Dhamma talks. So he tells you about his personal experience in, from the practice, how he dealt with uh, fear, for instance, fear of death. When you go into the mount, mountain or the forest, you might have to come across that, some wild animal. So he taught how, how to deal with this fear. And you know, just just by by his talk and by his by his experience and by his behavior, this is how we we learn from him. Mm-hmm. But mostly from the talks, you know, the talk is more detailed. But also his the, the, his way of life, how he came to the Dhanka practice, like he go, goes on arms round every day. This will inspire us to follow him. See, if he doesn't go on arms round, then we. You, then we want to also follow him. We don't want to go on arms around. <laughs> so a lot of what he teaches was is, is the way he lives. He lives in the forest. You know, he lives simple. He doesn't have any luxury trapping. Live very, you know. Have a pamanta. He he refused to have electricity or running water. Hmm. Only lately, I think in his in, in his later years when he was old, and, he, and there was a lot of people coming into the monastery. I think he allowed some electricity to some kuti, but not 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 all the kutis yet. Tan Chan. This is how, how 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 we learn from him by by staying with him, follow the way he lives, the way he practices. Lung Da Mahabua and Lumpur Cha Lumpuman, they all talk about. The importance of actually, um, or the usefulness in their own practice of the charnel ground meditation. So looking at corpses, bodies that have actually died in the decaying process. Um, how does someone nowadays, like there's just no such thing as a charnel ground in America. How does a modern person practice this contemplation of a corpse? Um, Ajahn Mahabu, I have a book called Kaya Katasati. And this book it contains a lot of uh, graphic pictures of human corpses and human bodies, human parts. So you have to go and search in the internet, search for corpse. <laughs> you know, it's I, very difficult. It's very difficult to find. It is difficult to find. I've seen that book, and there was one point when I actually thought about translating it to English. Yeah, I wish somebody would do that. I think it would be very useful. I thought so too, but then I heard about some other Westerners who found that book and actually were uninspired. It was just too much. They didn't understand like why all of these, you know, close ups photos of livers and people dying and how it's do you not for them it's not for them. See, this is for for the higher level of, of practice. It's for monks, those who devote themselves to to overcome the fear of death and the, the, the sexual desire. 
the sexual craving. But for people who still have family, have wife and husband, this is not for them. Tenenjin, speaking to those people, um, I'm sure we'll have many people who watch this and hear your words about devoting yourself completely to these foundations and about the necessity of jhana, the difficulty of jhana, um, the power of an awakening, and just feel like they have two kids, they have a job, they have houses, um, they, they can't dedicate themselves to practice in this way, and yet they also intuit the power of Dhamma and want to align their lives with it. How would you advise them to live in such a way that they don't always feel fractured or split um, like they're not living their their dhamma. Um, how would you talk to someone who has duties that keep them from practicing like this? Well, they can practice the lower level of practice. Practice generosity, charity, and practice uh, morality, keeping the precepts. Hmm. And maybe do just do mindfulness meditation just to calm the mind and relieve some of the stress. But don't you don't have to go through the vipassana level yet, in which you have to take the bitter medicine. Would Would you, you tell them the, take the sweet medicine first? <laughs> and would you say jhana, that people feel feel good when they do jhana? Most a lot of times like to do jhana and uh, dana. And would you say to them that the bitter medicine was for for later in their life or next life or? It's up to them when they want to take that that level. They they are welcome to do it any time. It's just a matter whether they're ready for it or not. That's all. Tony Chan, do you have any stories or advice for for lay people who are not busy with children? Maybe their children have left the house, and they are able to give more time to practice in America. Buddhism is so new, and there are people who want to give themselves to Dhamma practice. But they think they either have to ordain or they just, you know, just live a normal life, whatever that means. What what are some examples in, in Thailand that you've seen of lay people who really do devote themselves to practice and how does that what does that look like? Well, if you want to practice, you can do the first level of meditation, which is samatha pavana. Calm the mind first. And you know, whatever level of calm you can get, you feel satisfied, you feel happy. Don't go into vipassana yet. Yeah. Practice uh, meditation to calm your mind. And if, if it's possible, get to the fourth jhana. Once you have the fourth jhana, then your mind will be ready. You know that you can take anything now. Then you can go up to, to the vipassana level and then start to investigate the nature of the body, such as death, uh, repulsiveness of the body, so forth. But before that, don't, 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 don't worry about this thing. Don't worry about vipassana yet. Just worry about mindfulness. How can you maintain mindfulness all the time, from the time you get up to the time you go to sleep? See, you need the, this, this thing, they are like tools for you to apply later on when you get to the vipassana level. Without these two, you will not be able to, to go to the vipassana level because the thought of it just already scared you, right? To think about dead bodies and think about the 32 parts of the body. When in fact, you're living with it all, all your life from the time you were born until now. Where is the 32 parts of the body? It's right here, right now. Three of us, we all have these 32 parts. But we just never look at it, that's all. Because we are so scared of it. I don't know why. <laughs> this is what we call delusion, I guess, or avisha. Tanajan, I, I can't help but, uh, this isn't quite on the theme of the body, but I can never help but ask at least. Um, Long Tama Habua um, wrote about Long Poor Mun's enlightenment experience and in it, he has a vision of previous Buddhas and Arahants coming to visit him. And I, I ask just about what to make of that, because in the West, with people who come from this sort of dry materialist upbringing, when they hear talk about Nibbana as cessation, there is this kind of intuition of a dark emptiness, a blankness, a, a void. And 
so when they read something like that, it's both very interesting and confusing. How how do you explain how do you explain that side of of Long Poor Mun's description of his enlightenment, um, where it, it wasn't nothing but something different? Well, enlightenment in the, in the sense of uh, stopping your your mind from going on the, going in the rounds of rebirth is one thing. Enlightenment another in another sense is you have the psychic ability to 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 be able to access the spiritual world and see the various types of spiritual beings. This is this is another type of enlightenment, but it's not the enlightenment the Buddha stressed. The the type of enlightenment that the Buddha stressed is to is just the cessation of all suffering. So sometimes we we get confused with, 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 with these two things because the the psychic side of the mind can only be achieved by just a few meditators. Not everybody can. But the the cessation of suffering side of enlightenment, this could be ex- everyone who, who practice can 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 get to. So normally we, we, we're just talking about an arahant. See, there are four types of arahant, right? Arahant with psychic power and arahant without psychic power. So Ajahn Man just happened to be an arahant with psychic power. Hmm. He has the ability to connect with other spiritual beings. And the Buddha is, is just another spiritual being. The difference is that he doesn't take birth like us, that's all. We are spiritual beings, but we still take birth because we have defilement that keep pushing us to go take a new birth. But with the Buddha and all the arahant, they cut off this defilement. They, they eliminate this and this, defi- this, this defilement, so there's no, no, no force to push them to take rebirth again. But they still exist in the spiritual world. Hmm. So if they want to connect with another, another spiritual being, they can do it. They, they both have psychic powers. Tanajan, there's a phrase that comes up in the suttas, and I've heard some Ajans use. It's that to touch enlightenment with the body or touch awakening with the body in common, like the Buddha Gosa and commentary say that's that's the mind body that's being talked about. But what what does that mean to touch awakening with the body? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm happy I didn't study too much. <laughs> <laughs> Ajahn, uh just we have to, you know, let you go soon. But uh, what? Um... It's okay. It's okay. Time is no restraint here. If you like to. Talk okay. more, but unless you want to go, then it's okay. This is wonderful, um, Ajahn. Please, I did have another uh, question, just at risk of sounding more academic or intellectual. But um, there's different versions of the Satipatthana Sutta, like in Chinese and in in Tibetan. And there's one Chinese version where, in the section on the body, it talks about using the light, the perception of light, to help one's the Aloka Sanya to help one's practice of mindfulness of the body. Does that make any sense to you or what, what might that mean? I think it might mean it's the practice of mindfulness. Just mindfulness it's, itself. It's mindfulness, like a, a casino. You use mm. light to, to focus on light instead of on, on the breath. Mm. It's 10 casinos. I think there's in the, one, they are in the 40 Kamatana. Mm. Or color. Sometimes they use color, green color, red color, as the object of meditation. Tanajan, in terms of uh, that focusing in on, say, a casino, um, one debate, as you said, we're all very intellectual in this age, and perhaps too much so. But one debate in Western Buddhism is what jhana is in terms of being a constricted state. Um, where the mind unifies on one point or, or maybe casino and all sensory experience is, is gone versus uh, a more full bodied experience of jhana where, you know, in, in line with the Buddha's analogies on the first, second and third jhana being like water soaking into bath powder or soaking into lotuses, like one still is present in the body and has some sensory contact. 
I know a lot of the Thai masters seem to lean more towards the first interpretation as, as a single point. How would you parse those two interpretations of John out? Which do you think is, is uh, more correct? They're both correct. Sometimes you experience partial jhana. I mean, you still experience the sensory organs, the sensor, sensory objects. And another one is you're completely cut off from the sensory objects. Hmm. But what you might still have equanimity as the, as the same thing. Your mind doesn't react to these things anymore. Your mind just remains merely knowing. When you hear something, you don't get annoyed and you don't get happy from what you hear. You just merely know. Anjan, there's an experience when, at least when I close my eyes, being able to not really tell, like it feels like the body is just fuzzy, like there's no clear internal and external. And I'm curious what, how you understand that line or that this teaching that one remains focused on the body internally and focused on the body externally and focused on the body both internally and externally. What does, what does that mean and how does it feel? I think it refers to your body and other people's body. Mm. So like psychic ability or? No, no, just, just be aware of when you walk, you, you don't want to walk and run into another person. <laughs> person you <don't> <laughs> so, you, so you have to be aware of the other people's body as well. Mm-hmm. Or you can, th- can think about the external part of the body and the internal parts of the body. Mm. Anything above the skin is the external part. Anything under the skin is the internal body. It's just a matter of how you interpret it. Mm. But usually I think it's more like about your body and other people's body. When you contemplate that your body will get old, get sick and die, you also have to contemplate on other people's body. They also will have to get old, get sick and die. If not, your, your view will, might be lopsided and you might think you, you're the only person who will get old, get sick and die. And other people don't get old, get sick or die. So you have to try to see it thoroughly so you have a balanced view of things complete complete view of things not just one-sided view of things mm-hmm. Tanajan, what would you um what advice would you give us uh here in seattle just starting um i mean i think i know what the advice will be and that's to you know take care of our practice in the midst of all this but what, what advice would you give to the whole kind of Western Sangha as uh, we try to, you know, come and live in Western cultures that aren't acclimatized to Buddhism and navigate this whole new realm of culture and um, landscape? Uh, do you have any, any thoughts for us? You've lived in California for a while, I know. So you have some idea of how, how wild things can be over here. So, Well, I think the goal is to teach those who want to follow the Buddha's teaching. Those who doesn't want to follow, there's nothing you can do anything for them. Hmm. So they have to come to you. You don't go after them. But you can make your presence felt that you are here to help, to teach the Buddha's teaching. But if they're not interested, then no bad feeling, no hard feeling. But if they want to learn, we'll have we'll be happy to to show them the way the, the path of the Buddha. And one other question that's coming up for our the community here, and I think it plays into this question of how to be in the West um, or in, in moder- modernity is people are um, you know with all the different things going on in the world, global warming, politics, wars. Uh, it really weighs on people's minds and, and they wonder how to remain peaceful and calm in the midst of uh, of all that. So what advice would you give people who are worried about the news, worried about the election, worried about global warming? How would you how would you talk to such a person? Because we've got plenty of, of people in that boat. Look at them like you look at the weather. Mm. You cannot control the weather, so you cannot control all the happenings that's going on in the world. So just know it and accept it for what it is and and understand this this is the nature of the world. Things keep changing. Sometimes things go good and sometimes things go bad. And there's nothing you can do about it. You can what you can do for yourself is not to be stressful from from it. 
like merely accept, uh, accepting the truth. Don't try to have any desire or cravings for them to be like this or like that. See, our, our stress are created by our preference. We like things to be like this and things to be like that. When they don't go according to our preference, we feel bad, we feel sad. So we have to understand that things don't, don't, don't go according to our preferences. They go according to the condition that caused them to, to, to be or to happen. And we can only protect our mind by teaching the mind to let go of our preference and take things as they come, good or bad, right or wrong. Think, look at the world as the temporary place we come to, I don't know, to visit. We're like an alien, we're not here permanently. <laughs> One day we'll leave this world when this body dies. So we, we might enter into a new planet with a, a better worldly condition next time, mm. next birth, mm. if, we, if we still return. But the best thing is not to return because no matter how good things are, they will one day end. They cannot remain good all the time. Everything will, will change from good to bad. Tanjan, one, one final question. You've given a lot of encouragement for people to practice jhanas, to do deep meditation, and to go on retreat. Do you recommend, are there, is basically any retreat just as good as any others? These days, there's so much choice. Someone can do a Goenka retreat or a Mahasi retreat or go to a lay retreat. Are any of them okay? The best retreat is individual retreat. To be alone and practice and not get involved with anybody. But you, in order to do this, you have to know what you do, what, what to do when you're in that retreat. You have to know that all you have to do is developing mindfulness and meditation. If you don't know how to do that yet, then you have to join the group retreat first and learn how to develop mindfulness, learn how to meditate. But once you know how to maintain mindfulness, how to meditate, then the best kind of retreat is to self-individual retreat. Like you... go on, go on, going on a Dutanga, go on to Dong. Hmm. Monks go on to Dong, they go and meditate in the forest alone by themselves. Yes. We just got back from a, a Tudong with a, a couple of other monks, and, and hopefully you'll be happy to hear we will take a month-long retreat um, starting in a, a week or two, and we intend to keep the three-month winter retreat um, to try to do what you're saying, um, Tanajan. So, Good. Yeah. Good. And uh, Tanajan, just to say we, uh, you know, we said this before, but you've been such a presence in our, our lives and guidance, and we're so appreciative you actually take the time at in the evening to talk with us for for an hour and for your example and teachings thank you very much you're welcome i'm happy to be here talking to you i hope this meeting will help people to understand better the way of buddhist meditation the way of buddhist practices and maybe will improve their life the spiritual life to be more peaceful and happy. <laughs>